Everyone just keeps getting sicker and sicker, so the dietary guidelines obviously don't work. This is a very common idea. I see it all the time in the comments, and I think there's a nugget of truth in it, and there's also some misunderstanding. The nugget of truth is that the dietary guidelines have been pretty similar on the fundamentals for 40 years, and yet we have an epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes on our hands. So issuing these guidelines obviously isn't helping people, at least with those aspects, with their body weight and diabetes. So something more needs to be done. Just issuing guidelines isn't solving this problem. And I think that's an important realization, and it is urgent. Now, some people will go the extra step, and they'll say, we have these guidelines, but people just keep getting sicker, so it's the guidelines making people fat and sick. I think you can see through that logic immediately. Health guidelines also recommend exercise, physical activity, and yet people are getting fat and sick. So it's all the exercise making people sick. Every expert on earth discourages junk food, and yet people are getting fatter and sicker. So that recommendation is wrong. We should be recommending more Burger King and more Dunkin' Donuts. So that logic is confused, and we always want to be careful with these associations based on raw populational data just looking at a correlation in a population between two factors and trying to jump to cause and effect. This is called an ecological association. Just looking at two factors in a population that happen to occur at the same time or roughly at the same time and guessing that one is probably causing the other without any method of accounting for all the other possible variables. And it's, a very, it's very poor data in terms of getting at cause and effect. Another thing to clarify before we move on is this general idea that everybody's getting sicker and everything's terrible. It's a huge oversimplification. BMI undoubtedly rose a lot over the last few decades, especially in the West, and obesity and overweight skyrocketed, and so did type 2 diabetes. But blood pressure came down a lot over the last few decades. Cholesterol has decreased for decades. Cardiovascular disease, especially cardiovascular disease mortality, deaths from heart disease, have come down precipitously. They're almost half of what they used to be 50 to 70 years ago. So some things are worse, some things are better. We want to improve the bad without losing the good. Logical leaps aside, when it comes to dietary guidelines, we want to know a couple things. Are people following them? And if and when they do, are they better off or worse off? These controversies around the dietary guidelines often focus on the USDA recommendations. So let's take a look at the data for the US. Almost 90% of people in the US don't meet the recommended intake of vegetables. More than 80% don't meet the goal for fruit. More than 95% don't meet the goal for whole grains. And about 90% don't meet the recommendations for dairy or seafood. But Americans aren't under eating everything about 90% overeat refined grains above the maximum recommended. The only categories that are more balanced are total protein foods, like meat, poultry, and eggs, where almost 70% of people meet the recommendations, and the category nuts, seeds, and soy products, where about 45% of people meet recommendations. So Americans are massively under-eating recommended foods and mainly replacing them with refined grains. In fact, Americans now get most of their total calories from ultra-processed foods, almost 60%. And that number seems to be rising annually. No health organization anywhere on the planet recommends that. So regardless of what you think about the USDA recommendations, whether you agree with them or you disagree with them, it's clear that most people aren't following them. And from what I've seen, the pattern is similar in other Western rich countries, like the UK or Australia. Maybe a little bit less extreme, not quite as many obese people, but same general pattern. Probably less extreme in places like the Mediterranean region, for example, but overall the pattern isn't too different. People are generally getting heavier, and there's more type 2 diabetes than a generation ago. If you live somewhere that's an exception, where people are following the guidelines to a T, Definitely let me know in the comments because I'd love to look into it. So we can't ascertain the health effect of the guidelines diet just by looking at the general health of the population because most people aren't following them. That's pretty clear. Okay, what about 
the few people who do follow them. Are they better off or worse off? There are a number of analyses looking at exactly this question, and they consistently find that people whose dietary pattern is closer to the guidelines are less likely to be obese, have lower risks of cardiovascular disease, lower risks of cancer, lower risks of type 2 diabetes, even lower risk of total death. And in many of these analyses, you can see what's called the dose-dependent effect. The closer people are to the guidelines, the healthier they tend to be, the lower the risk of disease, and vice versa. So it's kind of a gradient. Now, maybe the guidelines diet is better than the junk food that most people are eating, but not that healthy overall. That doesn't seem to be the case, because several of these analyses look at other diets that have a lot of data behind them, and they look at them in parallel with the guidelines diet. Things like the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and in general, they look about similar. They all are associated with lower risk of disease and death, and by a similar order of magnitude. Now, maybe these people who follow the guidelines tend to be healthier, not because they eat that diet, but because of other healthy habits they might have. They may be people who pay more attention to health, who may be more obedient of official guidelines, and so they also smoke less and exercise more. Basically, it would be an association that does not reflect causation, like we talked about a minute ago. Fortunately, scientists who run these analyses for a living absolutely think about these things. And when you adjust statistically for things like tobacco, exercise, socioeconomic status, education, etc., etc., the effect still survives. People who follow the guidelines tend to have lower risks of disease. Also, there are a number of randomized clinical trials looking at this question. And when people are put on a guidelines-type diet, these studies consistently report improvements in parameters like blood pressure and cholesterol, and sometimes even glucose and insulin resistance. I've seen maybe 10 of these trials some show a stronger improvement than others. Uh, usually the sicker people are to begin with, the stronger the improvement. If they're pretty healthy, uh, if their values are all in the healthy range or borderline, you tend to see more modest improvements. That's all expected. Out of all those trials I've seen, I've never found one where people get sicker or are worse off when they are put on the guidelines diet. This is another very common question. I see this all the time. Maybe the guidelines diet is fine for healthy people, they can handle it, but sick people, it doesn't work for them. But the evidence doesn't seem to support this idea. Most of these trials that I just mentioned to you look at populations that are not that healthy to begin with. People who are obese or have high blood pressure or high cholesterol or insulin resistant or sometimes pre-diabetic, sometimes full-blown metabolic syndrome. And yet we consistently see improvements on a number of these parameters when they go on the guidelines diet. That's not to say that this is the only dietary composition that can possibly deliver improvements. Not at all. We'll come back to this in a second. But this very simplistic idea that the guidelines are making people sick, it's because of the guidelines that everybody's getting fatter and sicker. It's completely unsupported by the evidence. In fact, the evidence seems to be pointing in the exact opposite direction. And it's a good realization that this is a bit circular. The guidelines are based on the last few decades of scientific results. So when we take somebody and we put them on the guidelines diet, you tend to recapitulate the results that the diet and the guidelines are based on in the first place. So none of that is surprising. So when people say, well, the guidelines clearly aren't working, so it's time to try something else. We've already tried that for 40 years. First of all, we didn't really try it. Most people didn't try them. We've covered that. But yes, we need to be doing a lot more than just issuing guidelines that most people don't even read, let alone use them to base their dinner decisions on. Absolutely, that alone is not moving the needle. Just be careful with the logical leap that this means the dietary recommendations are wrong scientifically and we should be eating the opposite of the guidelines. That's like saying we shouldn't be exercising more and we shouldn't be cutting back on junk food or trans fats. Since those recommendations haven't worked, because everybody's getting fatter and sicker. Just another little side note, I sometimes see people railing about the food pyramid. It's the food pyramid that is making everybody sick. That's the reason for obesity and diabetes. The pyramid was discontinued 12 years ago. I think there are some old books, maybe by Gary Taubes, 
railing about the pyramid. Um, the pyramid is gone, at least in the US. What they use now is called my point. So if you disagree with the guidelines, that's fine. Just make sure you know what you're disagreeing with. Now, some really important caveats about the guidelines. I'm not saying the guidelines are perfect. I disagree with several aspects of the USDA guidelines. In fact, we've covered this before in a previous video. I think they're too lenient on alcohol. I think they're too lenient on added sugar. That's just an example, there's more. And I think several of these things are probably gonna get tightened in the upcoming version in 2025. I'm also not saying that the guidelines diet is the best diet for humans and we know that with certainty. How can you ever say that about any diet? It's based on the best evidence we have so far. Is it possible that in 20 years we'll have a lot more evidence and we'll know that another diet is even better? Sure, possible. And finally, and maybe the most important caveat, it's entirely possible that there's a subset of people that don't do well on a stereotypical guidelines diet, but maybe they just get drowned out. They get averaged out by the other participants in these analyses, in these studies, and that's why we don't see it. Maybe some people don't like that diet, can't stick with it. There's, maybe there's something metabolically different where they don't do well on it, possible. That's where personalization comes in. Finding a compromise that supports your short-term health and your long-term health and something that you can actually stick to in the long run and actually enjoy. That's crucial for applying science to reality. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of theories. The real problem we have in nutrition in public health is adherence. It's not knowing what to do, it's doing what we know. Lots of diet trials run into this problem where people just don't stick with the dietary changes in the long run. We've touched on this in previous videos several times. This is common, a common observation in all kinds of diets. With low-fat diets, with low-carb diets, with low-calorie diets, and with guidelines-type diets. Many people, probably most people, struggle to sustain a dietary change in the long run. So we have to keep that factor in mind and we have to work with that. The way I see it, this controversy about the guidelines is very similar to exercise. Exercise is recommended universally, but many Westerners, probably most Westerners, struggle to maintain a physically active lifestyle. So just repeating over and over, you gotta exercise, you gotta move more, it's clearly not working. It's not moving the needle. Experts have been recommending that for generations. It doesn't mean the idea is wrong. It doesn't mean the recommendation is wrong. It's just not helping people implement. There's a lot of factors that go into implementation, political, societal, psychological, but a big part of it is encouraging people to find their own way of achieving a physically active lifestyle. Some people love biking. Some people hate biking, but they love swimming. And some people hate both, but they're okay with gardening. And all of those are positive moves because they share some key principles. Very similar with diet. Some people like to eat lower fat, some lower carbs, some higher protein, some not so high protein. Those are all tweaks that can be done while at the same time taking advantage of what we know scientifically to optimize long-term health. We covered more detail about this marriage of personal preference with long-term health in this video. And this one goes into more depth on the USDA guidelines and what I agree and disagree with. Let me know your questions below. Take care. I'll see you next week.